Now I want to welcome our witnesses, the Honorable Tim Wirth of Colorado, Vice Chairman and President Emeritus of the United Nations Foundation, Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, the Albert Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. That's got to be pretty tough to get on your business card. <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, University Professor and Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at the School of International and Public Affairs, Columbia University, and Nicholas Loris, Deputy Director of the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies and the Herbert and Joyce Morgan Fellow in Energy and Environmental Policy at the Heritage Foundation. I will begin by swearing you in. Please stand and rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, without objection, I would like to have Senator Wirth, you are now recognized for five minutes to give your testimony. Was it, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Sachs, because I know you have a hard stop, so we're going to go with you first to provide your testimony. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, honored to be able to participate in these important hearings. In October 1992, the United States Senate ratified the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change with the objective to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. This is the law of the land under the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Yet for almost 27 years, the U.S. Congress has failed to adopt any major legislation to implement this treaty. Since 1992, greenhouse gases have risen relentlessly, with CO2 concentrations rising from 357 parts per million in February 1992 to 411 parts per million in February 2019. Climate safety is now nearly out of reach, thanks in no small part to the scandalous inaction of the U.S. Congress. In 2019, it is a bit late to discuss the views of congressmen regarding climate science. Despite the pseudo-debate over climate science in the Wall Street Journal and Fox News, there is no such debate among professional climatologists. This science goes back 150 years. It is uh, absolutely uh, a, a consensus and the type of claims that are made uh, about the debate are simply bizarre. In 2019, it is a bit late to doubt the threats awaiting humankind if the U.S. Congress persists in its un unconscionable inaction. The five hottest years on record have been during the past five years. The 20 hottest years on record have been the past 22 years. Temperatures are already 1.1 degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level and are higher than any decade of the past 10,000 years, the entire span of human civilization, uh, the so-called Holocene. The U.S. and the planet are buffeted by extraordinary heat waves, droughts, floods, forest fires, and extreme storms. The damage from climate-related disasters is soaring and has exceeded $450 billion during 2016 to 2018, or an average of $150 billion per year. World-leading climate scientist James Hansen, uh, long NASA's lead climatologist, recently published the finding that Earth is now as warm as it was during the prior interglacial period known as the Eemian, when the sea level reached six to nine meters higher than today. Hansen concludes that we are at dire risk of a catastrophic rise in sea level by m many meters. In 2019, it is a bit late to doubt the practicalities of stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions. Engineering studies galore have repeatedly demonstrated that we already have the technologies needed to decarbonize most or all of the world energy system, and that comprehensive decarbonization is within reach and is economical. The key steps are to shift electricity from coal, oil, and gas to renewable, zero carbon sources, mainly solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal, to electrify automobiles and home heating, and to meet other energy needs, for example, shipping, aviation, trucking, and heavy industry through a combination of direct electrification and synthetic fuels manufactured with zero carbon electricity. 
In view of these findings, the recent proposals for a Green New Deal make eminent sense, and a decarbonization plan should be put into legislation as soon as possible. Several recent studies have shown how the U.S. can decarbonize the energy system by 2050. Several states, including California and New York, are already aiming to decarbonize their power sectors before that date, yet the federal government is rudderless and without a plan because of the chronic inaction of the U.S. Congress. In 2019, it's late to claim that the U.S. should not act because other countries will not follow suit. The Paris Climate Agreement provides a mechanism to coordinate global actions. All 193 UN member states signed the agreement, yet only one, the United States, has declared its intention to withdraw from the agreement. With the science established, the climate disasters at hand, the future risks evident, the technological solutions available, and the diplomatic framework established, the question remains why Congress has so flagrantly failed. In my view, it is money. The oil industry supports the campaign funding of much of the Congress, much of this committee, and much of all of the Congress, especially on the Republican side. For all of Congress, the oil and gas sector contributed $82 million in the last election cycle. The largest spending was outside money at $35 million, PAC money 15, Coke Industries spent by itself 10.5 million. 87% went to Republicans. The Coke contributions, 94%, 99% to Republicans. Total campaign spending by the oil and gas sector since 1990 has totaled $622 million, with 81% going to Republican candidates. In addition to the campaign spending, the oil and gas industry spends an astonishing amount on lobbying. 124.8 million during 2018, which comes to $232,000 per member of Congress. The top five lobbying clients were ExxonMobil, Coke Industries, Chevron, Royal Dutch Shell, and the American Petroleum Institute. Their combined spending last year was $446.7 million. The total lobbying outlays of the oil and gas sector during 2010 to 2018 summed to a shocking $1.225 billion. 22 senators uh, wrote a letter to Trump asking him to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, every one of those senators, all Republicans, was funded by oil and gas PACs. The total oil and gas PAC spending for the 22 senators for the period 2013 to 2018 came to $5,870,000. The American people have lost con confidence in the U.S. Congress. Only 11 percent of the public expresses a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in Congress, down from 42 percent in the early 1970s. Only 8 percent describe the honesty and ethical standards of Congress as high or very high compared for example, with 84 percent for nurses. Our hopes rest with politicians who choose to run their election campaigns without accepting the corrupting money of corporate PACs, especially oil and gas PACs. All politicians should renounce oil and gas PACs and return to the business of protecting the American people. Mr. Chairman, I implore this committee and the Congress to act without further delay. 27 years of inaction are dangerous enough I know that I speak on behalf of millions of Americans and billions of people around the world who seek an urgent response to a world in peril. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. We are starting to bump up against a vote, but in the effort of trying to get a little bit more testimony in, Senator Wirth, I'd like to give you five minutes for the floor. And to Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm uh, delighted to be here and be back in the House where I spent 12 incredibly to have you here. Uh, my message today is really very simple. We've understood the science of climate change for over 40 years. It, it hasn't changed. It's just gotten more refined and more granular and more clear in its specificity. But the basic thrust of that science has not changed. We know about the climate problem. We know about carbon. We know where it comes from. We know how it gets generated. And uh, the basic question is, uh, given this, we have allowed this climate crisis to increase dramatically uh, 
And the question is, why did we let this happen the way uh, it has, and now what are we going to do about it? That's what you all are up to, and delighted that you're taking on this small and modest challenge. It's enormously important. We went through a period in the 1980s and 1990s of significant bipartisan cooperation. Uh, just as a marker of that, the biggest climate bill uh, in the Senate uh, was uh, introduced in 1990, and it had, uh, 20, it had 20 Senate sponsors, 12 Democrats, and 8 Republicans. I'll give you a flavor of the bipartisan nature of this. George Bush, when uh, George H.W. Bush spoke of the uh, uh, climate issue, he said, now I'm going to apply the White House effect to the greenhouse effect. And, you know, they really went to work on a number of significant changes in public policy that had to be made. There are all kinds of examples of partnerships that occurred between members of the Senate, uh, Republicans and Democrats, and the same thing was going on here. So what happened? How did this all come a cropper, which it did, uh, sometime in the late 1990s, early 2000s? And I would attribute the change and move away from this time of cooperation uh, to at least two factors. One, the uh, ozone agreement. The discovery of the hole in the ozone came in around 1987. And by, in a very short period of time, the Congress had acted, the ozone uh, treaty was signed, and changes were made very quickly, done very rapidly. But that was a sign to other people of what could be done and what, what, for those who were opposed to it, of the kind of issue that had to be stopped. A second marker was the uh, clean, air amendment, clean Air Amendments of 1990. That, in a similar way, I think, caught the industries uh, affected by surprise. Uh, again, uh, the Congress acted quickly. The leadership of the Congress acted rapidly. Dole and Mitchell were side by side in the, in the amendments. And uh, I think many in the industry thought, this is getting out of control. You know, what we've got to do is to make sure that the changes that are being requested and required you know, are slowed down, if not stopped. And out of that grew the Global Climate Coalition. The Global Climate Coalition was created by the National Association of Manufacturers, and in it uh, was just about every industry in the United States when it began in the, in the early 1990s. It continued for 15 years until it ran out of gas, but during that 15-year period of time, it had an enormous impact, uh, collecting political contributions, uh, raising enormous amounts of research money, doing a lot of advertising that was really very, uh, uh, very false in terms of uh, talking about the climate crisis. They became a major force uh, opposed to the changes that I think everybody in the scientific community believed had to be done and in which there had been a major uh, bipartisan agreement. Uh, that stopped. And now, why did it stop in, the, in 2020, in, uh, right at the beginning of the 21st century? Well, the political pressure from these groups was very was intense, and I think a lot of people were really thrown off stride by that, uh, just as the industries, I think, were caught somewhat off guard by the rapid movement of the uh, 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 Montreal Protocol on ozone and by the rapid passage of the Clean Air Amendments. amendments. I think many on the proponent side were caught by a surprise by the very rapid development of the Global Climate Coalition. Anyway, the two groups really remained in conflict you know, for, a, I'd say, a good 15 years. And it wasn't until the um, Paris Climate Accords they, uh, began the direction of those that these groups began to come together, aided by another very significant change, which was that most of the big industry groups dropped out of the Global Climate Coalition. They realized that the, there was a real climate crisis coming. They realized that there were great economic opportunities there, and they realized they had to get their industries more deeply involved in the public policy process. This occurred over, it didn't happen overnight, as you can imagine, but these industries, many of them became very involved and, I would argue, very helpful in turning the corner away from the world of confrontation back toward a greater time, a time of greater cooperation. By the time of the Paris Climate Accords, you know, the world had really come together in a very, this is a shorthand, obviously, but had come together uh, in a very interesting and important set of new coalitions designed to make progress. No longer was it going to be governments dictating what the solutions were going to be, but it was a different kind of a process that was 
grassroots, bottoms up, and, and very important in that fashion. So that is where we are coming out of 2015. Uh, we now have remnants of the battle. I think the current administration has not been helpful at all in encouraging the kind of changes that have to be made. In fact, uh, they have been discouraging those and trying to turn back much of the progress made and to destroy many of the institutions that were built. But even so, the momentum is very significant and continues. Which brings me to the final item I wanted to mention, and that is the Green New Deal. You know, I am a great supporter of the fact that the Green New Deal was introduced. I think that it served a major policy goal by illustrating again and bringing to people's attention the need to move. It was not a prescriptive. Nobody ever thought the Green New Deal was going to be prescriptive. It wasn't a piece of legislation. It was a not particularly well-drafted uh, prose document. But it raised the issue and the urgency of the intergenerational crisis. It raised the urgency of the fact that you know, we have to make changes that are going to impact possibly, probably, for the poorest people in the country, it had to be thought about and focused on, and it made uh, other statements about what everybody knows has to be done in the terms of the long uh, group of changes. So I believe that uh, uh, the people responsible for the Green New Deal deserve a pat on the back, not a kick in the, not a kick in the shins, but rather to say, good job, and we hope everybody can pick up on the thrust of what they were trying to do. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. Thank you, Senator Worth. And as is the case, we have votes that we have to go to. And, Dr. Sachs, I realize that you may not be here with us when we get back. And, Dr. Oppenheimer and Mr. Loris, I apologize that uh, we are going to put a delay on the continuation here. And uh, I would also like to thank my colleague, Mr. Higgins, for coming in so we could get this started. We are going to run to vote now. So we are adjourned till about, temporarily adjourned till probably about 3, recessed, uh, excuse me, till about 3.15. Mr. Chairman. And before we adjourn, I'd like, on the record, I'd like to submit a question in writing to Dr. Sachs if he's not going to be here, and I thank him for appearing today. Uh, absolutely, uh, that'd be fine, and, and we will recess until approximately 3:15 p.m. or when votes finish, whatever occurs sooner. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a speech tonight in New York. Yeah. I can't wait for Oppenheimer. You know that, Jeffrey. I can't wait for Oppenheimer. I know. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right. I'm off to the air.
Dr. Oppenheimer, I believe you are next up, so the floor is yours for the next five minutes, or as much time as you need. Oh, well, that's quite an invitation. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the committee for uh, holding these hearings. I think they're especially important um, in light of some of the uh, rather discouraging comments about climate science or the facts that we heard in this morning's full committee hearing. I was asked uh, by the staff to describe highlights in the development of climate change science that had occurred by late in the 1980s to illustrate how much scientists already knew at that time. Although the science of climate change and the greenhouse effect reaches back to the early 19th century, and you can read my full testimony if you want a summary and references, let me start by citing a 1979 report from the National Academy of Sciences. And I'll quote, we estimate the most probable global warming for a doubling of carbon dioxide to be near 3 degrees Celsius, which is about 5 degrees Fahrenheit, with a probable error of plus or minus 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now I'll go on. We have tried, but have been unable to find any overlooked or underestimated physical effects that could reduce the currently estimated global warming due to a doubling of, carbon, of atmospheric carbon dioxide to negligible proportions or to reverse them altogether. In other words, a committee 30 years ago, 40 years ago, looked hard at this issue, came up with estimates for the amount of warming that would come from doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which we're unfortunately well on our way to doing, and uh, gave an answer which is not much different than today's and could not find, try as, as hard as they would, a way to negate those, uh, that uh, warming of 3 degrees Celsius, which is quite substantial. The same remains true today. Things have not changed that much in respect to how large we think the warming could be. After an avalanche of scientific developments during the subsequent 10 years, we already knew a number of other things, and I'll just summarize them. This is what we knew at the end of the 1980s. By trapping heat, greenhouse gases had maintained a climate in which civilization developed and thrived. Much of the difference in the surface temperature between Earth and its two nearest neighbor planets, Mars and Venus, Venus being hot, Mars being cold, was due to the moderate greenhouse gas levels on Earth. Atmospheric concentrations of the primary human-made greenhouse gas carbon dioxide were increasing. We knew that at that time, mainly as a result of the combustion of coal, oil, and natural gas to produce energy. And that continues to be the case today. Earth's global mean or average temperature had increased by about four-tenths of a degree Celsius or seven-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit at that time, since the late 19th century. And sea level had risen as well. We knew all that, at, we knew all that then by the late 1980s. Today, Earth is close to a degree Celsius warmer, and sea level is about eight inches higher than it was a century ago. Fourth, we knew that the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would last for millennia, a very, very long time, unless a way were found to artificially remove it and store it somewhere. The same is true today. There's a long inertia in this problem. If emissions were not reduced substantially, Earth's climate would become warmer in the next century, and this is looking from the 80s, so the next century is this century, than it was over the entire history of civilization possibly warmer than it had been for several million years. Now, we just either got very close to or surpassed that, the first of those dubious milestones that is warmer than in the history of civilization. We may be there already. And we're, unless we do something to curb emissions, we seem likely to be headed toward a warmer planet over the next century than has been witnessed in several million years way before humans evolved. Resulting climate changes were expected to increase the frequency of very hot days and lead to impacts on water availability, crop yields, sea level, and natural ecosystems. We were worried then particularly about what was the canary in the coal mine of ecosystems, namely coral reefs. And coral reefs, due to a number of insults, including climate change, have begun to perish 
around the globe in the tropics where they live. Today, most of these impacts have already been detected and much larger changes are forecast. In other words, the broad outlines of a problem bearing high risk for humans and society were already clear, even if many important details remain to be fleshed out. They were already clear 30 years ago. To just bring us up to date, by the mid-1990s, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in which I have participated over the last 28 years, identified 19, 19 aspects of the global and regional climate, such as cloudiness, snow cover, glacier length, precipitation intensity, the thing that causes flooding rainstorms, for which scientists had detected trends associated with the warming. So it is not just global average temperature is going up, it is not just sea level is rising, many, many features in the climate system, probably if you could detect all of these changes, all, every uh, a, a notable feature of the climate system is already changing. Climate change has become pervasive and detectable across the climate system and the Earth system as a whole. Since then, the scientific consensus has only solidified as new observations of the climate system have emerged and improved modeling techniques have also been developed. Uncertainty on some important questions remains a fact of life in the climate science world. For example, the future rate of disintegration of the large ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica and the resulting effect on sea level rise remain largely uncertain, particularly in terms of what will happen later in this century. Uh, by the way, the potentially unstable part of the Antarctic ice sheet and the part of the Greenland ice sheet that is likely to slowly melt away together contain an amount of ice which, if at all were disgorged into the ocean, might eventually raise sea level by about 50 feet. That won't happen in this century entirely. Part of it will. Part of it will even if we slow emissions because there is a big inertia in the sea level rise system. Part of it will just continue to happen for centuries and centuries beyond, no matter what we do. However, Uncertainty in the face of high risk, uncertainty like this in the face of high risk, is no excuse for an action to reduce the risk. We can see the outlines of the future, and it is not very comforting, especially with respect to the ice sheets. I want to just finish with a word about the so-called climate skeptics. There is a great deal of difference between rational skeptics, those who are conversant with the scientific literature, who can be convinced by evidence, who subject their own ideas to rigorous review. There is a difference between those and the obdurate, uninformed skeptics whose ideas about climate change never or rarely are found on the pages of a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Regrettably, climate science has been under constant attack since around 1990 by the proponents of the latter approach and their facilitators. Presumably, due to the increasing political stakes attached to this issue. There is evidence that these attacks have reduced the belief by the general public that a scientific consensus actually exists at all, a disturbing development that I hope these and other similar hearings help to counteract. In conclusion, I would like to thank this committee and you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to testify, and I welcome the opportunity to answer questions, any questions you may have on this subject. Thank you, Dr. Oppenheimer. Uh, Mr. Orris, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Higgins. Uh, for this opportunity to testify this afternoon, I want to express that the views in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. With my time, I would like to offer four brief points, uh, the first three being what I perceive as the scientific economic and political reasons why we haven't addressed climate change at the Federal level, and the fourth being pro-growth policy solutions that are also pro-environment. First, it is clear that climate change is real and that human activity plays a substantial role. However, there are still many knowledge gaps and uncertainties that exist, including the very varying estimates of how a doubling of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere affects global temperatures and which trajectory of greenhouse gas concentrations most accurately represents future climate scenarios. 
Furthermore, estimating the economic costs of current and future climate change has its own set of problems. For instance, the integrated assessment models used to justify the social cost of carbon attempt to project, project costs out to the year 2300, which is problematic in and of itself. More fundamentally, reasonable changes to the inputs of these models produce widely different numerical results, making them unreliable in determining what the actual social cost of carbon might be. Other cost estimates use unrealistic forecasting or do not properly account for humans adapting to climate change over time. All of these variables impact how costly or not costly climate change will be. Second, the economic justification for Federal inaction on climate change is quite clear. The proposed policies at the Federal level would be costly and ineffective. Policies that restrict the use of conventional energy resources will increase energy prices, which is just a small part of the overall cost. Americans would pay more for food, health care, education, clothes, and every other good and service that requires energy to make and transport. Importantly, these policies are highly regressive, as they would disproportionately impact low-income families who spend a higher percentage of their budget on energy costs. With regard to the climate benefits from, climate, from Federal policy, they are practically undetectable. Even if the U.S. achieved net zero emissions goal, the averted warming would be less than two-tenths of a degree Celsius by the turn of the century. To have any impact on climate, the entire world would have to quickly change how it consumes energy or simply remain undeveloped. Both of these are devoid of reality. While many countries are rapidly expanding their use of renewable power, forecasts indicate that coal, oil, and natural gas will represent the overwhelming majority of the world's energy needs well into the future. For developing countries, reducing energy poverty and improving standards of living are the higher priority. Third, when it comes to the political obstacles, consumers' unwillingness to pay presents a hurdle for lawmakers. A recent poll found that 68 percent of Americans oppose paying an additional $10 per month to fight climate change. A separate poll found that 43 percent wouldn't even be willing to pay an additional dollar a month. Nor is action on climate change a public policy priority for voters when compared to other issue areas. Now, to be clear, my skepticism of unpopular, costly, and ineffective policies is not an excuse for complacency or a do-nothing strategy. I believe Congress should advance pragmatic policies that will drive energy and environmental innovation. For instance, our national laboratories are important conduits to spur technological advancements. We have benefited from Department of Defense R&D and alternative energy sources that have not only enhanced our military's mission capabilities, but have also produced significant economic breakthroughs. Another objective for Congress should be to eliminate subsidies for all forms of energy to eradicate the pervasive cronyism and corporate welfare in energy markets. Subsidies concentrate benefits to a select group of politically connected interests and disperse the costs amongst the rest of us. Moreover, this preferential treatment traps valuable resources in unproductive places. Instead, we should make emissions-free energy sources like nuclear and renewable power more economically desirable by fixing the excessive regulatory burden that plague these industries. Furthermore, competition in electricity markets provides greater choice so that if businesses and households want to go 100 percent renewable, producers can meet that demand. Expanding technological innovation through free trade is yet another avenue to meet the world's energy needs while reducing emissions. Tariffs and protectionist policies are unproductive. Lastly, we shouldn't dismiss the fact that access to affordable, reliable energy and continued adaptation to extreme weather is critical to reducing risk for families and businesses. A recent working paper in the National Bureau of Economic Research concluded that the drop in natural gas prices induced by the shale revolution averted 11,000 winter deaths per year. In addition, more, more resilient, durable infrastructure will protect people from climate-related vulnerabilities. Using the best scientific and technical information available will improve resilience and readiness for current and future climate-related challenges, no matter what the cause. Mr. Chairman, thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Warris. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. This hearing is the first in a series of hearings on climate change that the Oversight Subcommittee on Environment plans to hold during the 116th Congress. It is my goal that we can work in a bipartisan manner to examine the history of climate change, the effects of climate change that are currently being felt across this great nation, and solutions to the current climate crisis, solutions that not only will address this critical issue but create new industries and jobs for those countries who take a leading role. <clears throat> 
It is our job as representatives of the American people to prevent the effects of climate change from getting worse. That is why I am holding this hearing, not to point fingers at any of my colleagues, not to chastise industry players and executives just for the sake of it. We are here to solve a problem of enormous magnitude, and the best solutions to big problems have always been forged by all of us coming together to devise sensible, feasible solutions that account for the diversity of American interest. Today we will affirm that the science on climate change has been known for decades, as we have seen from the testimony already. In 1977, Exxon Oil Company's own in-house senior scientist told the company's senior management that, quote, there is general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. This same scientist went on to say in 1978 that we had a, quote, time window of five to ten years before the need for hard decisions regarding changes in energy strategies might become critical. Again, that was 1978. Exxon acted on this information, immediately launching further research into the effects of carbon dioxide on the planet, research that included extensive climate modeling. Royal Dutch Shell, in an internal document titled The Greenhouse Effect, outlined Shell's extensive knowledge of climate change implications and warned by the time global warming became detectable, it would be too late to take decisive action. That was also in 1988. These aren't liberal environmentalists making these dire predictions. They are oil companies' own management recognizing the scientific reality and the need for serious action. These energy companies knew then what we all know now, science matters. The U.S. government also knew. In 1988, Dr. James Hansen, a NASA scientist, testified before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources on a panel convened by one of our witnesses here today, Senator Tim Wirth. Another one of our witnesses, Dr. Michael Oppenheimer, testified that Dr. Hansen, uh, with Dr. Hansen on that panel, and together they warned the Senate and the American people of the dangers of a warming planet. America listened. President Ronald Reagan created the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. President George H. W. Bush helped convene the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992 and signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change an intergovernmental treaty recognizing the problem of climate change and calling on all nations to take efforts to address it. This treaty was ratified by a unanimous vote in the Senate. It seems incredible, I know, but in 1992, the U.S. government agreed with 154 nations that, quote, human activities have been substantially increasing the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases that these increases enhance the natural greenhouse effect and that this will result in an average and an additional warming of the Earth's surface and atmosphere and may adversely affect natural ecosystems and humankind. In 1997, the nations of the world met in Kyoto and decided that the problem was serious enough that each nation needed to go further by making binding commitments to reduce emissions. In 2015, the parties met in Paris, and due in large part to President Obama's and Secretary of State John Kerry's in-depth negotiations with China, the parties came to a collective agreement that all nations in the world would work to keep the average global temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, and ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius. That is the Paris Climate Accord. The U.S. was part of this global consensus until June 1, 2017, when President Trump, contrary to overwhelming fact-based evidence from the scientific community and the direction set by Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush, announced his unilateral intention to withdraw the United States from the Paris Climate Accord. This announcement was made almost 29 years to the day after Dr. Hansen testified that global warming was a threat to this planet and to humanity. Now, here we are in 2019, and the Federal Government has taken very little action in response to climate change. The science hasn't changed, the scientific evidence has been there all along, but the politics did. Political disagreements are a hallmark of democracy, and I welcome constructive debates about what to do about the problem of climate change.
But politics should be separate from the acknowledgement of the problem itself. The science was clear then. It is equally clear now. And our panel today is going to help us make sure and sense of why the U.S. has not taken decisive action to address what we've known for, for decades. Again, I want to thank the uh, individuals who have come to testify. I will close with, I believe that the U.S. can rise to meet this challenge and to quote John F. Kennedy, we will do so not because it is easy, but because it is hard. As Americans, this is our time to lead the world as we have done many times throughout our history, for us, for our children, and for all future generations. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, the Acting Ranking Member, Mr. Higgins, from Louisiana. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for their participation in today's hearing. There's a couple of things that I've noted from listening very carefully, very prayerfully to the testimony thus far. Everything here, everything around us, is touched in two ways, by regulations of the federal government and by the oil and gas or petrochemical industry. The clothes upon our back, the glasses that we wear, the seats upon which we lean, the carpet under our feet. Let's have no illusion about the point of today's hearing. The majority has called this meeting for the sole purpose of condemning the oil and gas and petrochemical industry. I call for a bipartisan and candid discussion about the challenges of climate change that we face as a species that are blessed to inhabit this earth. It is our responsibility to address these challenges within the parameters of our Constitution and based upon a sober interpretation of the sciences available to us. I am old enough to recall when the science of the time stated that very soon global cooling would overtake the planet. And the language changed to climate change. And now, in today's hearings, we have heard more about global warming again. So it is not the doubting of science. It is the reasonable question of the interpretation of the scientific data. This is what we seek. And we must recall that we are a union of 50 sovereign states a representative republic with constitutional parameters, and that there is no such thing as Federal money. It is the people's treasure. We will no doubt hear of accusations and anecdotal stories to justify inquiries into American businesses. This day we will hear this. By global standards, these industries are leaders for operations conducted in the cleanest and safest manner. American industry leads the planet in clean, efficient, and safe operation. You will perhaps not hear from my colleagues across the aisle the countless achievements our nation's energy industry has made towards cleaner and more efficient operations. In fact, since the year 2000, the oil and gas industry has invested over $108 billion into greenhouse gas mitigation technology. The slide behind me, based upon reporting, in 2015 and 16 alone, the oil and gas industry directly reduced emissions by the equivalent of 57.1 million metric tons of CO2. American industry did this, not Chinese industry, Indian industry, Brazilian industry, American industry. For comparison purposes, this reduction of CO2 is equal to the same amount of carbon sequestered by 67.2 million acres of forestry. Further, the investment in the non-hydrocarbon resources made by the oil and gas industry, such as wind, solar, and geothermal resources that my colleagues have made their priority, account for over 16 percent of all our nation's investment into new and emerging sources. I support these private investments by industry and by other organizations. And all of the above energy strategy should be our path. It is my goal forward for America, and I look forward to the progress that will be made, especially into small modular nuclear reactor technology, solar, and other sources of clean renewable energy. But this will come from American industrial investment, not from bureaucrats in D.C.
Every one of us wants to leave a cleaner environment for our children and grandchildren. However, the demonization of the fossil fuel industry and radical calls for its abolishment are increasing for my colleagues across the aisle as posturing takes place for the 2020 elections. Even if we were to completely curb our nation's CO2 emissions, which at this point would destroy our national economy and injure countless Americans, it would not make a dent on global emissions. Countless other nations, including China and India, would immediately negate any progress that we made. The American industrial model should be the model for the world and within the parameters of our constitutional restraint to recognize the, the rights of states and individual citizens therein. We're limited in scope. What shall we do to address these problems with reason and soundness of judgment? We should not call for radical proposals that end fossil fuel. We should be working internationally to bring American industry ingenuity and standards to other countries. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence. I look forward to today's hearings and the testimony of our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. At this time, I'd like to recognize myself for five minutes for questions. I'd also like to point out that I, too, Mr. Higgins, am thankful for the attempts and direction that the energy companies are leading in embracing clean energies and renewable energies. Uh, but as they pointed out from their own studies from the 1970s and 1980s, we need to do more and we need to do more sooner. And that is really the goal of these hearings, is to move in that direction, uh, not to have discussions about eliminating industries, but looking at how these industries can help transform our economy and the world's economy to clean energies and renewable energies. Because this used to be a bipartisan message. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, we saw bipartisan support for just this purpose. In fact, I used to be a Republican. I remember when environmental stewardship was something that was front and center for Republicans. And I'm hopeful that this committee and the full committee, as well as our entire Congress, can get back to recognizing that it's not a debate about whether climate change exists and humankind's influence, but what we can do together to address it. So with that, I'd like to begin my questions here today by asking the panel, and I want to make sure I heard correctly, none of you believe that climate change does not exist. Is that correct? And all would agree that humankind plays a primary or leading factor in that regard. Is that correct? Let the uh, record show that all three witnesses agreed with that information, both Democratic and Republican witnesses. That brings us to our next question, the urgency of acting now. Senator Worth, what role do you think the government must play in order for the United States to meaningfully respond to climate change? First of all, I think we have to remember that one of the things that we have talked a lot about how things have changed over the last 40 years, and one of the most important things that has changed is the fact that uh, so much of American industry, and Mr. Higgins mentioned this, so much of American history has become engaged, you know, been very supportive of climate reduction efforts, and been very much out front, in fact, often um, beyond what uh, anybody in the government might have been doing at the time. So what are they asking? They are often asking for make sure that the rules and regulations that govern uh, our whole energy package, and a lot of those are uh, our federal rules, are ones that can facilitate. And I think a review at all times of the regulatory apparatus is a very, very constructive step to take. And investments in the future, an R&D strategy much more uh, effective than the one we have now, I would certainly recommend that we undertake. I think there are a variety of items in the so-called Green New Deal that, should, that must be pursued and understood, if not very specific items that are there, certainly the thrust that we have to be deeply concerned about the um, communities in the country and around the world that are most affected by climate change, you know, how are they affected and what kind of equities are built into whatever climate solutions we make. 
what kind of an intergenerational compact are we leaving for the next generation or the next two generations that come along, you know, and how do we make sure that uh, those interests are understood, which means that we have to act much more aggressively and much more, rap and much more rapidly. So I, I, in my testimony, I lay out a number of specific items that Senator Hart and I, for example, uh, developed in response to the Green New Deal and all the criticism it received by way of saying that we thought that the Green New Deal had done an enormous amount of good by focusing attention, uh, bringing people to think more broadly about, uh, about what has to be done. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Orris, some of the testimony from Dr. Saxon, he is not here to, to talk about it, but talked about the uh, uh, money in politics. And H.R. Uh, 1, which was passed uh, by the House a few weeks ago, uh, helped and hopes to address money in politics. I believe some of your testimony talked about that as well. Uh, can you elaborate on if we had greater transparency in getting the money out of politics, especially in this industry, uh, how that might be able to positively impact addressing climate change? And second, and, and arguably more important, the economic incentives could be shifted to drive renewable clean energies and allowing energy companies to be a leader in doing so. Yeah, well, I think the best avenue to getting money out of politics is to reduce government intervention into the marketplace broadly. Uh, and that comes with getting rid of all of these subsidies that accrue to the oil and gas industry, to the coal industry, to renewables, and to nuclear. Because if you get the government out of picking winners and losers, uh, there's less of an incentive to lobby. Uh, there's more of an incentive to rely on the market price and price signals to drive innovation in the energy sector. So I think. The, the root cause of some of this is just the, the historical policies that we have had in the past, whether it is subsidies for oil and gas or something like the renewable fuels mandate. These are all policies that incentivize more lobbying and trying to keep the entrenched special interests the status quo rather than um, trying to reform energy policies more broadly. I think the renewable fuel standards is a very good example because uh, a lot of environmental activists are now against first generation biofuels. Uh, there is a, a whole host of world hunger organizations that are against first generation biofuels, yet this policy is in place because it benefits those entrenched special interests. So when we get the government out of the energy sector and picking winners and losers, it, it reduces that root cause of lobbying. Thank you. And at this time, I will yield five minutes to you, Mr. Higgins, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Loris has, has been talking to the media for quite some time about natural disasters. I believe this is a false narrative. It is not supported by recorded occurrences. Being from southern Louisiana, I am going to focus on hurricanes. Over the past 60 years, the United States has seen a steady decline in hurricane landfalls. This is contrary to what if you stop most Americans that pay attention to mainstream media or perhaps the scientific interpretation of the day, which has shifted since I have been alive from global cooling to climate change to global warming, that most Americans would say, surely, landfalls have increased, but the data proves otherwise. The data clearly shows that natural disaster rates have decreased over the years. Despite these positive projections, today's natural disasters are more costly than ever before because of Federal, State, and local governments have failed to invest in infrastructure. I am from Louisiana, born and raised South Louisiana. I am no stranger to natural disasters. A after Hurricane Harvey, I went into Texas with civilians on rescue operations. In the last rescue operation I personally participated in, I will never forget, we rescued an elderly gentleman from his home. We were get him, getting him out of there, and, and he, was, he, was, he was safe physically. We found out I was a congressman. I certainly didn't look like one. I'll never forget what he told me. We should all remember this. He said, he said, Congressman Higgins, I've lived in my home since 1968. I've seen this much water fall, but I've never seen this much water rise. And, and this struck home to me in my heart. And since I've been in Congress, we've made it, we've made a focus of our office to res restore funding for proper dredging for our water management systems, man-made or natural, to restore their intended parameters. The water is trying to get back into the Gulf. 
we as, as government entities at the local, state, and federal level have, have failed the American citizenry regarding the impact of disasters, which, which the, the data clearly shows the frequency of which have decreased, but the, the costliness has increased, not because God is dropping more water on us, but because we have failed as government to maintain our water management systems. In Louisiana, private industry, specifically the oil and gas industry, is a private investor in coastal restoration projects to limit the effects of hurricanes, while Congress continues to spend billions, hundreds of billions of dollars responding reactively to disasters. The oil and gas industry has invested proactively. Mr. Loris, looking at some of the past hurricanes that have impacted the Gulf Coast, such as Katrina and Harvey, is it that these storms are more powerful than ever before, or that we, is it that we haven't significantly invested in mitigation infrastructure? Would investments in our infrastructure help curb the effects of natural disasters? If, if, if you'd take a portion of this minute and 30 left, and then I'd like the other gentleman to respond. Yeah, sure. Would investment in inf infrastructure help our nation? It would. It would help our, our civilian infrastructure and it would help our military infrastructure. I know a, a lot of the previous hearing focused on climate change's impact in the military, and, and we've seen that no matter what the cause is, military installations have been impacted by flooding, uh, coastal erosion, and other sorts of, of natural disasters and extreme weather events. What happened in Nebraska most recently is a good case study of the federal government lagging on the ability to approve infrastructure that would have helped reduce So the you concur that investment in infrastructure is a realistic response to the impact of natural events and water events, natural disasters. Doctor, do you have a comment on that, sir? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I have a comment on a few things that have, you have laid out. First of all, uh, U.S. landfalling hurricanes. You are quite correct. There is no known long-term trend. However, in the North Atlantic Basin, which includes the Gulf and the East Coast of the United States, there has been uh, virtually certainly a trend in an increase in intense hurricanes. Now, we don't understand why hurricanes sometimes hit the coast and sometimes go harmlessly out mm, to that's sea. That's a valid point. I am on limited time. Okay. Would, you, would so, you share that data with, with, surely, with my surely. office and the committee? I would also, one more point along those lines, Hurricane Harvey has been subject to intense analysis, which has shown that one of the reasons the flooding was so intense was because the precipitation intensity was enhanced by a warmer ocean feeding more moisture into the system. The, your third point about infrastructure, I think you are absolutely right that we need to be ready for nastier and nastier climate extreme events, and we are going to, in many cases, need an enhanced investment in infrastructure. Thank you for your clarification. And, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for the tone that you have set for this hearing, sir. It is quite bipartisan, I think, helpful for us all. Thank you. I would like to recognize the gentlewoman from California, Katie Hill, for five minutes and also ask that she chair for me while I step out for a moment. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Um, Senator Worth, you have spent much of your life in public service serving your country, and I want to thank you for that, including as a member of this body. You were on the landmark panel in 1988, which included Dr. Hansen and Dr. Oppenheimer, where the alarms were first sounded on climate change. Do you happen to remember if there was much talk about the next generation on that panel and, and about protecting our kids and doing something for our kids? Well, I, um, there were two scientists on the panel, Oppenheimer and Hansen, and I was just the convener. I was the political hack putting it all together. Um, but well, the, the uh, discussion afterwards was truly intense. I think people were very surprised to hear somebody say, this is not something that is theoretical, but it reached over from the theoretical into the practical. This is something that we observed. And the impact that that then began to uh, uh, engage for people was significant. And um, the, was there a focus on young people? Yes, because we began to understand this was going to be an intergenerational battle. 
and we're not going to be able to solve it in one generation, but we're leaving for the next generation an enormous legative of damage that's been done to the environment and the living community. Well, so the, it's our obligation to really move on it much more aggressively than we might have otherwise. The, the reason I ask is because I was born in 1987. So when you had that panel in June of 1988, I was in diapers and I was nine months old. I hadn't walked yet. So um, oh, now, we welcomed you. <laughs> so now I'm I'm the generation that's here, and I have kids literally coming into my office almost every day who are seven, eight years old. Uh, their parents are telling me that they have nightmares. They can't sleep because they're worried about climate change and they're worried about whether there's going to be a planet. So um, you know, I'm I feel obligated to be the voice of the next generation who's standing here saying nothing was done or not enough was done, and I know that's not on on you, per se, but I do think that this is a mandate that we have to act now. And I'm also, I come from a, a district that's very split between Democrats and Republicans, and one thing that I've, I've learned recently is that Democrats and Republicans didn't seem to be so far apart as they were previously. Did, can you tell us if Democrats and Republicans on the committee shared a belief in the science on climate change? Well, at that point, uh, as I pointed out earlier, uh, we introduced a major climate bill, the first big one, right after the Hansen hearing, and uh, 16 titles that ranged all across everything we've talked about today and more. And then the, at the time of introduction, there were 20 members of the Senate who, were, who sponsored the bill on its introduction, and those were 12 Democrats and eight Republicans. I mean, there wasn't no, there was no, we were following in the footsteps of Dole and and uh, and Mitchell, who had a very tight partnership in thinking about what had to be done in the, in the world of clean air and the Clean Air Act amendments were just coming up. There were any number of partnerships that between members of, the, uh, uh, of both parties. So there was a real feeling of cooperative uh, endeavor. Now, how that got broken up is something that's worthwhile you all sure. thinking about and coming to understand because I think there's a very important lesson in that. And uh, from that, we might get a better sense of how we bring people back together again. To understand our history is always a helpful thing to do, I think. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Oppenheimer, would you, would you agree? On bipartisan? On, yeah, the, with this impression. Of and, course. And the, Many of the, uh, the political leaders I dealt with over the years were Republicans and were exerting strong leadership on this issue, going back to Senator, Rhode Island Senator Chafee. And uh, we'd love to see those days return. So, you, uh, Senator, you attended the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, uh, where over 100 state heads of state assembled to address global warming for the first time in history. In the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the treaty that came out of that summit, the parties, including the United States, bound themselves to, quote, stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic human-induced interference with the climate system. That treaty was supported by both by President George H. W. Bush and ratified unanimously by the Senate in 1992. Uh, Senator Worth, uh, how did we get from that place to, you know, with unanimous ratification to the Senate's rejection of the Kyoto Protocol just five years later? It seems like a very quick turnaround. Well, I think at that point things were moving very rapidly, uh, both among the advocates and the opponents of doing uh, doing anything in terms of climate change. I think that the uh, people who were very concerned about uh, the Clean Air Act amendments, about the Kyoto, about the uh, uh, ozone treaty that came out of Montreal, there were a number of major national and international actions at that point that I think caught many in the industry by surprise. It happened so quickly, and out of that, I think they decided to mobilize, and out of that came their very effective, uh, from my perspective, unfortunately the uh, effective, the Global Climate Coalition, and that lasted for about 20 years, engaging almost every major industry in the country until they dropped off slowly but surely and the Global Climate uh, Coalition faded out in the early part of the, of the 20th century. I, I know I'm, I'm out of time, at, but I just want to sum up quickly and tell me if I'm right or wrong, but it sounds like the fossil fuel industry got scared of rapid changes happening and kind of mobilized and left the next generation, my generation, in the dust and left us with a lack of action entirely. And the advocates on the other side were caught by surprise themselves at the vitriolic and incredibly well-organized and highly funded uh, efforts on the other side. So suddenly both sides who would, 
been spending an enormous amount of time and energy together for the last 25 years were split asunder by you know, this rapidly changing political environment. Well, I would argue that we now have to make sure that the time is now to not be caught by surprise. We have had 30 years to, to try and figure out action moving forward. And I, I thank you for your testimony. And we will carry the torch. I yield to uh, my colleague over there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm, so when we are talking about how we move forward and we talk about clean energy, and I, we talked about this a little briefly this morning. And, but the conversation that, I, I mean, that, that we have to continue to have is as we move to these new forms and continue to use them more, such as wind and solar, uh, we have to recognize that in order for those to work, I mean, more efficiency in buildings, those things all are great, but the highest driver of carbon pollution in the United States right now is transportation. And so as we move to wind and solar and electric powered vehicles, we are moving towards batteries. Batteries are a part of this conversation. And the metals we use in batteries are, I am just going to use two examples, because China, China essentially controls about 90 percent of the world market in um, rare earth metals. And then cobalt is all actually incredibly important for electric vehicles, and that is mined in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So as we move forward to this, and we have done a lot over the last decade to become energy independent in this country. But are we having conversations about that infrastructure and what we are doing? Because I am not aware of a lot of rare earth mines being permitted in the United States. And I, I know for a fact that China does not always have our best economic interests at heart. So as we continue to, continue to transition into these things, don't we have, I mean, because we are offshoring pollution doesn't necessarily mean we I mean we're dealing with carbon emissions but at what expense and that's my question and I'll start with Mr. Loris and then but really ask everyone because most of these places would be qualified as superfund sites in the United States I mean they're incredibly toxic to ground rather they're incredibly into toxic to the environment so in our quest for cleaner energy it doesn't do us a lot of good if we're exporting pollution, whether that means we're exporting oil, natural gas, coal to companies that don't, or two countries that don't have our regulations, are creating a market in countries that have an economic incentive to mine these products as fast as possible and not in the cleanest way possible. And then from a national security and economic security standpoint, do we have to be concerned that one country will control 90 percent of essential materials we need to create these batteries? Well, I think from uh, an environmental efficiency standpoint, your, your point is well taken. If you look across the board at, as to what the United States does with regards to mining and operations uh, or cement manufacturing, uh, our energy intensity is far better than developing countries, and our emissions per unit of output is far lower than developing countries. And so if we enact expensive regulations, that are going to drive these companies overseas. You are essentially exporting those CO2 emissions and making no noticeable impact in climate. You're actually making things worse. So, so that's problematic. Uh, secondly, I think the environmental review and the permitting processes for all energy infrastructure projects are in need of reform, whether it's for rare earths mining, whether it's for renewable projects and transmission lines and siting. The, the more we have competitive regulatory reform that allows these technologies to come online that allows these mines to be developed, uh, the better off we will be in terms of a, an economic efficiency standpoint, uh, but also just from a, an energy access standpoint. I think both uh, concerns are valid. Uh, if we are fortunate and make an energy transition quickly, that will probably involve electrification of transportation. That implies uh, if it's going to work and reduce carbon dioxide emissions at the same time, uh, a, a grid with higher levels of storage and a smart advanced grid that can wheel the renewable, the intermittent uh, renewable power, merge it with remnant amounts of fossil fuel power over but, time. And I just want to, so, just briefly, but it's storage storage requires batteries. Yeah, that's correct. Storage, th th these issues about rare earth metals, et cetera, are issues of batteries, too. And, but it is not a solution to the problem to let an industry develop here, which would maybe satisfy security concerns, and let it be as dirty as the same industry is in China. It is a healthy, strong, reasonable regulatory system 
that we need to make sure we don't wind up with a cesspool here the way it is in some other countries. Well, and I don't disagree with that. I, I just, I mean, we, we, we talk about permitting for solar and wind and the problems we run into in that, whether it's at state or the federal level. I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, in all reality, the permitting for a rare earth mine, I mean, we are not going, I mean, we developing these quickly is not, I, mean, I hope we do develop them, but I, I'm a little skeptical that we can develop them quickly. I'm more concerned about reliance on a lot of these countries to provide our energy which after working hard to become energy independent. But with that, I know I'm past my time. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And now I recognize a gentlelady from Michigan, Congresswoman Tlaib. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in my district, uh, we've been fighting for years to hold corporate fossil fuel polluters like Marathon Petroleum, um, the coal carbon uh, uh, industry accountable. When black piles, I don't know if you heard this story, but black piles of um, what they called petroleum coke started showing up on the Detroit riverfront, blowing into people's homes. Um, and many of us organized around that, even though the state and everyone said it wasn't toxic, we had it independently tested and had carcinogenic and all these other toxins in there that caused cancer and respiratory issues. And we fought extremely hard to get it removed, but it was, it was because of land use, not because of environmental protections. Um, it was, you know, for, for many of us that live um, in these communities, uh, for us, you know, it's not 12 years, our 12 years is here now. And that's how I feel when we talk about climate change. If folks want to see really what it looks like not to do anything, you should come to my district, where I think the smell, sometimes gr growing up, I thought that smell was normal. And one of five children have asthma, have some of the highest rates of cancer and respiratory issues in some of my zip codes uh, within the 13th Congressional District. So I'm really concerned about the fossil fuel industry and others, which are continuing to poison our national conversation and stop meaningful federal action on climate change. So I'd like to go right to the panel and to ask each of you, are you aware of any organizations that are currently working to spread misinformation or so unreasonable doubt about the science of climate change? Well, I think the, the organizations that are in opposition have become much more subtle and, and sophisticated than they were before. You know, they're not coming out and confronting the issue of climate you change. You mean they're hiding? Well, you know, hiding, use your language. I mean, they are hiding, but they're yeah, much more sophisticated about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are they're funding university laboratories, for example, which is a way of insinuating themselves and legitimizing a lot of the work that they do, some of which is very valuable, by the way, but not to be, uh, be perfectly straightforward and honest about what's going on. I'll give you an example. In my backyard, the oil shell and industry has just boomed, you know, and the amount of fracking is like, looks like measles on some of the counties in Colorado. And one of the key issues going to what you were talking about in terms of health is methane emissions. Mm -hmm. And what we're now learning about methane emissions and children's health and endocrine disruptors and what happens, you know, there's very, very subtle kind of science. And that's enormously important. And that has to be also part of what we think about. That's what you're seeing in Detroit. Yeah. That's what we're seeing in nor north of Denver and that whole, uh, in the whole shale area. You have to figure out how we're going to put set together rules related to methane, just like you're looking for how do you set rules related to uh, coal emissions. That's right. So, I, and I don't want to, there's organizations like Heartland Institute, the Cooler Heads Coalition, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, uh, and ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, are still promoting these climate misinformation campaigns, as you know. So. For example, in 2011, Alec made a submission to the EPA docket, which I would like, uh, Chairman, if, uh, without any objection, would like to submit for the, for the record of the committee, where they said, quote, um, carbon dioxide is a natural occurring, non-toxic, and beneficial gas, and it poses no direct threat to the public health. Statements like these are false and misleading. Uh, it must be, it, it, it makes me so angry because I have so many children that are directly impacted by doing nothing. Uh, do not take, you know, many of them do not just take, you know, um, I wouldn't just take my word for it, but take the word of Eric Schmidt, uh, the chairman of Google, who vowed to disassociate his company from Alec because, quote, the facts of climate change are not in question anymore. And Mr. Schmidt went on to say, and so we should not be aligned with such people that are just literally lying. And so, Mr. Lawrence, 
Uh, is it true that your organization, the Heritage Foundation, has received funding from petroleum industry sources like the Koch brothers? I think we have in the past. I don't know what the last time they gave us money has. Yeah. But could I clarify one thing is mm -hmm. that never has any donation or contribution to my organization ever influenced what I write uh, or how I view energy economics. Okay. And you're a former employee of the Koch Charitable Foundation, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, According to, a rep to reporting, the Koch brothers have donated more than $100 million since 1997 to dozens of groups that spread climate misinformation. According to reporting in New Yorker, the, Kochs, uh, the Koch brothers have, quote, funded many sources of environmental skepticism, such as Heritage Foundation, which has argued that scientific facts gathered in the past 10 years do not support the notion of catastrophic human-made warming. Is that correct? The, the catastrophic part is what's correct, is that in my opening statement, as well as in my written testimony, I acknowledge that man-made emissions are contributing to warming. You know, from 1951 to 2010, you've seen over 50 percent of the warming likely attributed to man-made emissions. What I think is irresponsible is those climate catastrophe scenarios uh, that are borderline impossible. If you look at what the IPCC looks at in the National Climate Assessment with regard to different representative concentration pathways of greenhouse gas emissions, where you get the really scary climate scenarios is if you have every ounce of coal extracted from the world, if you have low technological development, if you have low economic growth, and you have a, a tripling of our population, essentially. And I don't think those scenarios are all that realistic. And so, I, yes, I. I think some of that climate catastrophe scenarios are, are not grounded in reality. That's not to say that climate change isn't occurring that they're not, and that there aren't costs, but those, those high-end scenarios are, are very unlikely. This time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from New York, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of my larger concerns is that climate change is not just an environmental issue. It is also a crisis created by massive corporate corruption and misconduct. And in fact, ExxonMobil is currently the subject of a massive New York lawsuit alleging that the company defrauded and deceived its own investors by engaging in a, quote, long-standing fraudulent scheme, unquote, to downplay the risks posed to its businesses by necessary climate change regulations. What's concerning to me overall is that this is part of a pattern, private and public, that uh, it's about the role, the knowing, deliberate, and aggressive role of the fossil fuel industry and corporate lobbyists in misleading the public about the scientific consensus on climate change. For decades, there's been a coordinated effort to confuse the American public about dire threats to their threat and life, to their health and livelihoods. In fact, the fossil fuel industry and lobbyists have uh, funded third-party groups, often with misleading names, in order to uh, confuse and sow debate where the scientific consensus is established. So uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, I have a question. One of these groups, it seems, was called the Global Climate Coalition, the GCC. Um, it was an international lobbyist group that opposed action to reduce emissions. Um, can you tell me anything about this group, including who funded their efforts? Um, the Global Climate Coalition went out of business, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, in 2002, I think. So we're talking about history. Mm -hmm. I was very familiar with the activities of the Global Climate Coalition because I attended many of the international negotiating sessions that resulted in first the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and then the Kyoto Protocol, and which continued beyond that. They were active players at that time and appeared to be quite influential with some of the, the uh, delegations from various countries, mm. that, uh, particularly those that have had strong interest in the fossil fuel industry. So would you say? And, and they, at that time, themselves put out some statements which were flat out uh, distortions, lies, mm -hmm. you can characterize them in a number of ways about the science, which is what I focus on the most. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I apologize, it's just because we have limited I don't. Time. I can't tell you who funded them because I don't. Sure, know. sure. Um, so it seems here what we have evidence of is that um, the, the GCC, the Global Climate Coalition, 
uh, they knew about the scientific basis of the greenhouse effect. They knew that this was true, um, but, and they knew that they could not deny the scientific consensus, so instead their primary goal was to sow doubt. It seems as though here that the Global Climate Coalition was actually largely funded by lobbyist groups and uh, business in, fossil fuel business interests. Uh, does, that, does their advocacy seem to align with, um, with that? Yes, but let me be a little more specific to make mm -hmm. it clear. I knew several scientists from, for instance, ExxonMobil at mm -hmm. that time. I worked with them closely at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. They were smart. Mm -hmm. They were knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They never in the scientific deliberations ever mm -hmm. said a word which led me to believe believe they were biased because of their companies. But it seems to me uh, the people who paid them didn't listen to what they said when they went home. Because I know those people knew the truth about that. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it seems from uh, what we've dug up in history that's absolutely true, is that some of the first scientists to sound the alarm about climate change came from within ExxonMobil. And once they, and once they found out, and once these, the fossil fuel industry found out from their own scientists that they were responsible, in large part, for climate change, they then started to contract lobbyist groups and third-party organizations. In fact, uh, in 1988 and 89, when the federal government first started to realize the extent and the damage and the great threat that climate change posed, uh, we moved immediately, very quickly, to the Kyoto Protocol in 1992, and it seemed like we were well on our way to address this issue until, uh, according to a report by The Guardian, the former President Bush rejected the, the Kyoto Protocol, and I quote, based on input from the Global Climate Coalition, this lobbyist-funded group. Uh, Senator Worth, did you have any experience with industry attempts to undermine the Kyoto Protocol or any other international climate agreements? Uh, oh, yes. We thought we were putting together a pretty good agreement. The Kyoto Protocol was the first time to make specific instructions for what would come out of the uh, Earth Summit in 1992. Mm -hmm. So it would put very real restrictions in various places. So would you say that it's fair uh, to, to conclude that Industry, fossil fuel industry lobbyists are largely responsible for our failure to act well, they certainly on made climate an change a generation ago? They certainly made an enormous contribution. Let me just tell you one story. One of the major international meetings we were working in, um, and the Automobile, Merrick Petroleum Institute, and there was one third very large lobbyists sat right outside of the negotiation room. And it was threatening them. It was, they were clearly trying to bully delegates coming in and out and grab them as they came out. It was astonishing to me. Now, this is the first time I had seen this, and it was as if uh, you know, they had hired real shock troops. Well, they backed off of this kind of tactic later on, and then they faded out of existence. But they were, they were right into it and uh, you know, were very, very effective in terms of giving people worries and concerns about who they were and what they were doing and so on. So these lobbyists were literally sit, sitting like, right sitting, outside? He's sitting right outside the door. There are Watching three, the lawmakers There were three chairs in. right outside the door. I'll never forget it, you know. And I happen to know you meet all these guys in the process. And I went over and said, what are you doing? And they sort of laughed, and then they kind of buttonhole somebody again. It was, uh, you know, it was maybe the low point of all wow. of that, but it was very real. Thank you. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, I'm actually going to give you a little bit more time. We are trying to accommodate another member coming, so I'm going to let Fabulous. the acting ranking member follow you Thank for a you. minute or two while another member gets here. It's so you've got approximately day. 30 seconds to ask one more question. Great. Um, so I have another uh, question here. Dr. Oppenheimer, can you tell us about the climate misinformation campaigns of the American Petroleum Institute? They never showed me their plans, uh, although I do remember that some of them accidentally became public mm. uh, sometime during the, the uh, second Bush administration. Mm. And the name of API appears in many of the groups that have been identified today as uh, members, supporters, funders. And my interactions with, mem with uh, the representatives of API at the climate negotiations uh, at, I think, meetings of the plenary sessions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, made it quite clear that they were there to influence the delegations, mm -hmm. which they have a right to do, by the way. 
Uh, what is unseemly is the kind of thing that uh, Senator Wirth indicated, which I was witness to, too. These people would sit in the meetings, send hand signals sometimes to delegates, and essentially seem to be instructing, I remember in one episode, the delegates from Saudi Arabia. Wow. Well, so it was almost like, uh, like the lobbyists were the pitcher. Oh, and they were kind of giving these hand signals, letting the delegates know what they can and cannot vote on based on the lobbyist interests. Absolutely. And it was widely observed and widely Shocking. known at the time. It's important uh, to point out also, if I might, that they, the companies quickly faded out. No longer could you find companies as members of the Global mm -hmm. Climate Coalition, mm -hmm. but rather they were trade groups, the Farm Bureau, Edison Electric, the American Forest Products, Chamber, so they were Com kind Chamber of, of Commerce. So that was their cover group. So those were the dominant members. So they were kind of creating these second and third degree organizations so that they could distance themselves from the political damage of climate denial, but still fully participate and fund it. That was always it. my opinion, yeah. Um, one last question. With the API, in 1998, the American Petroleum Institute created a multi-million dollar, multi-year communications plan to create climate skepticism. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to add these documents, which we have obtained to the record. So moved. And you are out of time. I apologize. Thank you very much. <laughs> With that, I'd like to turn it over to the acting ranking member, Mr. Higgins from Louisiana, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, you, you all have struck me as an excellent cross section of reflective of the very best of American uh, intellect. Uh, Senator, what a, what a wonderful statesman you are, sir. You, you've, you've struck a tone here that uh, has made me smile. You're and very kind. Thank Doctor you. Doctor and Mr. Loris, uh, your scientific observations have been enlightening. I just like to, I just like to challenge this body, and I'd like you, you gentlemen, to respond. By by what measure would you advise us to move forward with reason and seeking truth within the parameters of our constitutional authority and in recognition of states and individual rights? And within that context, uh, would you agree that scientific consensus changes uh, through, the, through the years? Uh, what was once considered scientifically unviable is, is in the next scientific journal found viable. What was once believed to be absolutely true is discovered to be not true. So within the context of a, of a, of a bipartisan, bicameral Congress with a sworn duty to serve the people and the representative republic of these United States. By what measure may we move forward? And I'll begin with you, Senator. <clears throat> well, I think what, uh, one of the first things that uh, I would do, Mr. Chairman, uh, is to uh, con convene some of these other experts who have really dealt directly with this. For example, um, the, um, Chad Halliday, who is the chairman of Shell, may be one of the most reasonable energy executives you've ever met, and he is working very hard to get his colleagues among the very big oil companies to come kind of get on board and what can they do to advance the goals of uh, Paris and get to the 2050 goals. And he's a remarkable man who previously was the head of DuPont and was chairman of the board of the, of the Bank of America before assuming his responsibilities at Shell, which I think is now the largest American oil company. But anyway. I would, I would have him come. I would have Naomi Oreskes from Harvard come, who has done the best research that I know of in terms of who was trying to influence uh, opinion and how did they do it and when, and when did they do it? You know, when did they know when did they do it? But she is, she is absolutely terrific. It's getting people like that at some length that you have a chance to talk to. You know, these five-minute things are great. I understand that and understand I'm, the constraints. I'm quite that. sure that, that with the chairman's leadership and the, the ranking member for whom I sit today, uh, with their leadership, that's, that's a, the formula we shall seek. And perhaps the gentleman can uh, answer questions in writing. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Good. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize from the State of Kentucky, Congressman James Comer, also the ranking member of this subcommittee. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I know that this committee has gone long, and I just wanted to clarify something from the uh, full committee meeting this morning. Uh, 
with respect to some statements that were made regarding uh, the questions that I asked Senator Kerry, the, uh, you know, I don't think anyone on our side denies climate change. Uh, we just basically had questions about how we're going to pay for this legislation. That was the first part of the questioning that I wanted to ask uh, Secretary Kerry and, and uh, Senator Hagel. And I didn't get to the, the next part of the question, that, or I guess rather statement that I wanted to make, was that with respect to agriculture and coal, two industries that are huge in my uh, southern and western Kentucky district of Kentucky, with respect to coal, I don't disagree that the natural gas is, is cheaper than coal today. I just feel that we need to have a diverse energy portfolio in America. And I believe that there are, are negative implications uh, that are affecting communities that a lot of people in Washington don't realize. With respect to agriculture, uh, and with all due respect to, to John Kerry, who's talking about crop yields and things like that, I doubt he's grown a lot of crops in his lifetime. And I'm a farmer, former commissioner of agriculture. Uh, I believe that every year yields are, have significantly increased. And I believe agriculture doesn't get the credit it deserves in making efforts to reduce its carbon footprint. We in agriculture uh, want to pass the land to the next generation in better shape than it was when we received it. And those are some of the statements that I, I wanted to make that I, I didn't uh, have time to make today because we were arguing over the, the cost of the uh, first proposal that, that's received a lot of attention with respect to, to climate change, the Green New Deal. But uh, I look forward, uh, Ranking Member uh, and Chairman, to be able to have dialogue on this issue. I do think it's a, an important issue, but I think that uh, it's been heavily politicized in a way that, that uh, is creating unrealistic expectations for people that believe passionately in, in the issue. So uh, hopefully we'll have good dialogue as we move forward and we'll uh, be able to uh, address a concern and figure out a, a, a realistic path forward in a way to, to uh, pay for any major proposed changes that don't put the United States at a competitive disadvantage. There was a lot of uh, knocking by Senator Kerry on uh, President Trump's leadership. One thing that I think the American people support, or at least they do in, in my district, is the President's leadership in trying to put America back on a level playing field to, to create manufacturing jobs, to bring back manufacturing jobs. One reason we lost manufacturing jobs to China and, and other countries is uh, they have much more lenient environmental laws. And when you poll the American people, the issue that consistently rises to the top of their concern, whether they're liberal or conservative, whether they're rich or poor, is the economy. So I, I applaud the President's leadership in, in trying to do that, and I look forward to having uh, open dialogue with both sides as we come to uh, solutions that are affordable and achievable for the American public. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and yield back. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Bach, can I just comment very briefly on the two points that are made at the beginning? I think those are grounds for two really good hearings, going back to the question of where you go from here. One, the impact on coal communities is something that is very seldom I think uh, really drill down on. People talk about only so many jobs for coal miners, but that's not the point. There are truck drivers and restaurants and the whole communities that are dependent upon this, and how do we make that transition? I don't think we know how to do that, and I think that's a real contribution that can be made by this committee. Similarly, in the area of agriculture, there's been much talk about the impact that agriculture can have in working on the climate issue and sequestering carbon and so on. But that's been skin deep in terms of, I think, the, for the most part, the analyses. And that's a, so that's a second area that I think you can very constructively delve into and you know, come up with a set of recommendations that really haven't been as deeply probed as I think they have to be. So 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could I add to that, Thank Mr. Chairman? Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Oppenheimer, was that yes. you spoke? Yes. Uh, with regard to uh, the two points you made about uh, coal and agriculture also, and of course I support what Senator Wirth said, um, globally, that includes the United States also, I don't know about the situation in Kentucky, crop yields have actually slowed. The growth in crop yields is not what it was several decades ago. And it slowed because the benefits of the Green Revolution have basically run out. They have spread worldwide. And in addition, there is another headwind. That is, that there is evidence that the climate changes that have occurred have marginally started to reduce crop yields of the major cereal grains in many areas. I am not asserting that it has affected Kentucky yet. It is to be a concern for the future. So we welcome the engagement of farmers, both in the issue of how to adapt to these changes and how they can contribute to enhanced carbon sequestration, for instance. The other is, you know, it is perfectly plausible that a technology, technologies that exist to capture carbon dioxide emissions from coal-burning power plants and scrub them and sequester them could be part of the long-term solution. So I, I think we ought to work together to try to figure out which of these opportunities are the most economical, which will solve the problem across the board, which will bring co-benefits of reduced air pollution. And, you know, I don't think we need to write anything off completely. Thank you, Dr. Oppenheimer, and thank you, Senator Wirth. And thank you, Ranking Member Comer, for your comments as well. At this time, I would like to recognize uh, the gentleman from California, Congressman Gomez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in light of this history of climate denialism, I am deeply concerned about President Trump's dangerous statements on climate change and how they can lead to another 30 years of inaction on this issue. It might come as a surprise to many that President Trump did not always hold these anti-climate change beliefs. In 2009, along with uh, Deepak Chopra, Ben and Jerry, and his three children, the current president signed on to a full-page ad in the New York Times calling on President Obama and Congress to pass legis legislation restricting greenhouse gas emissions. It read, quote, we support your effort to ensure meaningful and effective measures to control climate change an immediate challenge facing the United States and the whole world today. It goes on, quote, if we fail to act now, it is scientifically irrefutable that there will be catastrophic and irreversible consequences for humanity and our planet. But as we sit here today, the President regularly goes on unhinged and on rants about climate change that could be uh, pulled straight out of the industry playbook, making statements that are clearly scientifically inaccurate, to say the least. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, I would like to run a couple of the President's statements by you to assess their validity. Leading up to and during his campaign, the President dubbed climate change, quote, a hoax, a total hoax, an expensive hoax, and a total and very expensive hoax. I guess we got his point. He believes it's a hoax. Is climate change a hoax, Dr. Oppenheimer? Decidedly not. The President has accrued climate, uh, accused climate scientists of having, quote, a political agenda. Are your scientific opinions and those of your colleagues based on a political agenda? So, a good scientist can separate his political and personal biases from his uh, scientific understanding, his or her. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be a scientist. It's, My colleagues work hard to do that. It's to say the, the world is round and, again, it circles the sun, a uh, political agenda? Not as far as I can no. tell. Science. Um, in an interview with 60 Minutes in October of 2016, the President said, though he no longer thinks global warming is a hoax, quote, I think something's happening, something's changing, and I'll check, I'll change back again, and it'll change back again. Wow, he changes his mind a lot. Um, Dr. Oppenheimer, if we do not take any action to decrease our emissions, is it likely that climate change will change back again, that it won't occur? No. The d climate does vary. It does vary due to many factors, including variations in Earth's orbit, which are very slow, and variations in the sun's intensity, which, happen in, which are small, however. What we know now is that human beings have taken control of the climate machine, so to speak. The largest variations in climate are going to be the global warming trend for as far in the future as we can see. Thank you. Um, in the same interview, this was a doozy 
interview, referring to sheets of ice melting into the ocean in Greenland. The president said, you don't know whether that, was, that would have happened with or without man. Uh, Dr. Eipenheimer, how sure are scientists that these changes in our climate are due to human activity? We are sure that most of the climate change over the past 50 years is due to human activity. With regard to the ice sheets, they are complicated. Certain parts of them are clearly uh, uh, melting due to climate change, due to the human-induced climate change. With other parts, the changes are not fully understood by us. Thank you. Um, Dr. Heimer, this kind of rhetoric, I believe, is really designed to mislead the American people and will delay critical congressional action in order to maintain the profits of polluters. Senator Wirth, would you agree that in order to address the cli uh, climate change at a global level, the United States must play a leading role? No question about it. And the, <clears throat> the world, at every one of these, every meeting that I went to over a 30-year period of time, you walk into a room, the first question you can feel in, among your colleagues is, what does the United States think about this? That was so important. It was thrilling to be U.S. representative, but also you recognize the enormous responsibility the United States had, because we had the research, we had the, we had the capacities to lead and to persuade and to become engaged. It was a wonderful time, and we have to get back to that again. I agree with you. I, I believe that the U.S. role and uh, and its leadership on this issue is can be overstated. Um, before I uh, yield, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to um, regarding the ad that I mentioned. It, it reads, "Dear President Obama and the United States Congress, tomorrow leaders from 192 countries will gather at the UN Climate Change Conference and uh, Conference in Copenhagen to determine the fate of our planet." And it was signed by Donald J. Trump, Chairman and President, uh, Donald J. Trump, Jr., uh, Eric Trump, as well as Ivanka Trump and the Trump Organization. So moved. Thank you so much. I yield back. I would like to thank our witnesses for coming today. I know it has been a long day with a few interruptions along the way as well. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair which will be forwarded to the witnesses for the response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. I would also like to thank my colleagues here for uh, attending this hearing, this very important hearing. This is the first of three phases. Uh, today was focused on the historical evidence at hand. Uh, we will also be talking about the current situation as well as the future and the opportunity to address climate change. I am encouraged that I do believe that smart capitalism and good government can provide the innovation and advancement to address these issues, and I am looking forward to working with the colleagues across uh, both parties in accomplishing that outcome. With that being said, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.